So let's get started. Um, it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our conference keynote speaker, Peter Calthorpe, the principal at Calthorpe Associates. He's a founding member of, member of the Congress for New Urbanism. Peter has been named one of the 25 uh, innovators on cutting edge by Newsweek magazine for his work redefining the models of urban and suburban growth in America. Peter, throughout his career in urban design, planning, and architecture, has been a pioneer of innov innovative approaches to urban revitalization, growth, and regional planning. Peter was named the 2006 Laureate of the Urban Land Institute, J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development for his work in walkable communities and land pres preservation. He currently spends a lot of time working in China, working on these issues, and he just recently published a book on the issue of urbanism in the age of climate change. Please join me in welcoming Peter Cawthon. Um, so I'm going to talk today, uh, it, it's interesting, so much of our really important new work has been supported by high-speed rail in California because they s really understand the nexus between that piece of technology and our urban growth patterns and how the two need to feed into one another and be deeply coordinated. So I'll talk more about land use than about the technology of uh, high-speed rail. Um, and quite frankly, uh, a kind of broad scale relationship between high speed rail and AB 32 and our current law in California, SB 375, which is the first one to call for land use to be shaped on behalf of reducing automobile dependence. And of course, reducing automobile dependence and the relationship to a, a whole hierarchy of transit systems uh, is, is deeply intertwined. And so you can see the relationships uh, and of course, the environmental impacts of our transit networks, including high-speed rail, are all deeply, and in the end, really manifest by the kinds of land use patterns that they foster. Um, this is a map, uh, you know, you've all seen it, of, uh, of the high-speed rail system, but it shows the regional governments that are under uh, law by SB 375 to reduce VMT uh, through land use policy. And of course, that land use policy always goes towards transit oriented development. And so that law and the investment in high speed rail go hand in glove in terms of fostering a whole new pattern of development. What's also fascinating, of course, is this large area in the middle, the, the Central Valley, and how it relates to the two economic nodes of Northern California and Southern California. And somehow bringing that central area into the economic mix in a more forceful way is not only the goal of SB 375, but also clearly one of the major attributes of high-speed rail in California. When it arrives in the cities, I think people have talked a lot about this already. Um, it, ha it can and should and will have a profound impact on economic development and on the form of the region. Now, years ago, I worked on something called Compass Plan, which was uh, the Southern California uh, uh, Council of Government's first take at trying to look at alternative patterns of growth that weren't so auto-dependent. And as part of that, and this preceded high-speed rail, we looked at economic, the economic structure of the region. When we do regional plans, they're not only about the environmental limits and the linkages from transit, it's also where job centers are located and how they relate to housing and transportation is really at the heart of a lot of the most difficult congestion and air quality and VMT related issues. So mapping out a region's kind of economic um, uh, geography is really step one for us when we start doing regional plans. Now this is Southern California, the dark, uh, the, well they are dark, in, in the, the, uh, the, the blobs shown are the high-density employment centers. These are the Class A offices, more of the white-collar environments um, and where job centers are clustering. The large circles are the light industrial, low-density, single-story type um, back office uh, zones of employment. Uh, and of course, there is a logic to this structure of the region, and it were, were the trade routes that came in from 
the Long Beach Harbor and came up through along rail lines, always originally. So one of the most fascinating dimensions that we seem to uncover, especially in the United States, um, um, always, that these, these core areas, not just downtowns, but our core centers of jobs, often are strongly related to existing rail corridors, right-of-ways, and those, of course, are, are, are opportunity areas for expanding transit. And we know all the arm wrestling that goes on between, you know, the use of that right-of-way uh, between freight and, and um, passenger. But nonetheless, there is this fundamental shape to our regions that is already transit-oriented. And so you can see here with this, these alignments, uh, almost all the major employment centers are on major transit right-of-ways. This is the freeway network and the airports, which have, in the last 20 and 30 years, become the new armature for economic development. And sadly so, well, you, I would say overtly sadly so. I mean, we know the isolated office park at the freeway intersection is not the most opportune uh, frame for that critical daily destination of, of people seeking out job centers. And of course, airports uh, tend to breed around them very large, low intensity employment areas. And so these are no, uh, other factors in the economic structure of the region. Now overlay high-speed rail, and you begin to see this phenomenal correspondence, but for the leg down to the, uh, to the uh, port, um, of these job centers and corridors of employment, uh, completely synonymous with the, uh, the location of the track, and, you know, for many good reasons. But you can see very quickly and easily how this kind of system then builds on an existing economic geography in a region uh, in a positive way, reinforces it and extends it and, and um, catalyzes it effectively. Um, now, when you look at mobility in Southern California, and I'm just using Southern California as an example, actually the, the pictures aren't as compelling in the Bay Area because we are uh, much lighter on, on uh, a lot of these things, transit. If you look at their new high, uh, light rail system, which of course goes into uh, downtown LA, and the extensions for that system, then you look at a really robust commute train system, extensions, and what will be their new BRT rapid transit um, framework, and then you look at that network as a support structure for high-speed rail, and you begin to see a whole nother synergy, which is how high-speed rail not only re reinforces the economic geography of the region, but also uh, doubles down on the investments in other forms of transit and will enhance ridership because, of course, it will become a major destination. But it's not just that the high-speed rail station is a destination for somebody who is going to go and, and transfer but because of all the jobs and, and development that will happen around that station also being a destination for local uh, transit networks. So when you begin to look at, study these overlaps and these layerings, um, I think we can all begin to see really profound um, uh, opportunities. Now, I'm gonna just quickly go over maybe some stuff you all get. But all this is premised on the idea that transit oriented development really becomes one of the foundations of future growth in the state, hopefully in the world. But you have to understand that transit oriented development is first and foremost walkable places. There is no great transit station if it's, not, if it's only surrounded by parking lots. Uh, and more and more you can see when you look at the difference in mode split uh, across U US versus Europe, Take Sweden, 50%, over 50% of trips are walk-bike. It's that kind of physical environment that makes the transit network viable, useful, uh, and compelling, and quite frankly, competitive. You all know that if you arrive at a, your a, a transit stop and you can't get to your destination because it's not walkable, you're not going to use the transit network. And the same is probably true of high-speed rail, although high-speed rail has this dual nature, a little bit like an airport, uh, letting people arrive from great distance and therefore maybe renting a car uh, is obviously one mode that's gonna be much stronger than the local transit networks. But the degree to which the high-speed rail links into these local transit networks is the degree to which their viability is, rests upon 
uh, intelligent land use patterns. Now, SB 375 and AB 32 as this companion, as I see it, to high-speed rail is based around the idea that we can change people's behavior, that we can become less automobile dependent in, in a country that has decided that it is obsessed and, and, and never, will never be able to break it, its addiction to oil and or cars. But it turns out that that's really just not the case, and it's not even the case today. It's not even some utopia in the, in the future that we have to look forward to when people change their behavior. Their behavior is very different based on where they are in the metropolitan framework in the, the ge geography. So this mapping by census tract of VMT per household shows everything from six to 8,000 vehicle miles per household per year in downtown San Francisco to a very comfortable 12 to 14, I may not get the numbers right, over here in the East Bay, all the way up to 32,000 VMT out in the orange areas in the outer East Bay. And that, those differences are the kinds of framework that we have to put into place in creating a land use future for California that marries comfortably with a transit and high-speed rail future for California. So just to be really explicit about it, if you took San Ramon and its landscape of subdivisions and office parks, compared it to Rockridge, which is just down the street here, I think you all know it very well, and you looked at the quality of housing, which is still single family in Rockridge, but smaller and mixed, as opposed to large lot in San Ramon. And you looked at the quality of the walkable shopping areas, which are easily served by transit, mall versus Main Street. And you look at the opportunity for including jobs in those environments. There's no question that Bishop Branch, shown here, is an environment that you can only drive to. Uh, that there's no opportunity, there's really no choice because you're stranded uh, midday, end of day, beginning of day. Uh, so for this latest book, I, I did a little research, which is actually rare for me. Betty can attend, attest to that. Um, and actually, Betty, you'll be happy. This, one, this book is the first time I ever used a footnote, which is a huge step forward for me. Um, so there is real data here, and it's very interesting when you get to it. Um, uh, urban, say, uh, uh, Russian Hill in, in San Francisco, si six m metric tons uh, per uh, capita, 10 in Rockridge, and 21 out in the suburbs. So there's a, almost a four to one ratio in carbon. Density uh, is almost 15 to one. Um, and, you know, San Francisco neighborhoods are fairly low density urbanism. They're not, this is not Shanghai or uh, Singapore or any of these really places that are serious about high-density urbanism. And the difference in VMT shown here is, as I mentioned, you should all be familiar with the walk score, which is a really wonderful online tool to actually identify exactly how walkable your neighborhood is. Just put your address and it'll tell you your destinations. And San Francisco is just about perfect. Uh, San Ramon probably isn't 46. Their old algorithm measured distance to destinations as the crow flies, which, of course, in that kind of environment is, no, um, is, not, is not a good way of measuring a walkability at all. But the most fascinating part is the value per square foot that the marketplace puts on these different environments. Now, all three of these are upscale, you know, high-income uh, neighborhoods. But people are willing to spend a lot more to get close to transit, to be near... Um, the urban center and the urban job focus. Uh, and uh, w what's astounding is Rock, uh, San Ramon, you know, with, with um, uh, its golf course communities and the rest of that, used to be the paradigm of where wealth would go. Um, and it's fascinating. These numbers are, are matched across the country. Good urbanism creates more value per square foot um, regardless of of uh, yard size. Now, this is all because we have new demographics, and we're not driven by large families with kids anymore. You probably all know 23% of households now are families with kids. And so that changes the fundamental foundation of what and who we're designing communities around. In the end, 
We need more diverse housing opportunities. We need more affordable housing opportunities. And we need more urban housing opportunities. Otherwise, the, the cost of an urban house will continue to be high, largely because it's scarce, not because it inherently costs more to deliver in the marketplace. And when you look at it, I know this may be a little far afield from exactly high-speed rail, but what this is about is why the fundamental land use patterns in this state and I think across the United States are going to change. And when they change, they will be in concert with the kinds of investment we need to make both in high-speed rail and in local regional transit. So look at the costs here. If the average household in the U.S. is $50,000 median disposable income, and 50% of it goes to housing and transportation. And by the way, in the Bay Area, that number is closer to 60% on average. And of course, the burden falls most heavily on low-income communities. If you own three cars, it's going to chew up, uh, the green is the car cost, more than you can spend on your house. If you own two cars, it gets a little bit more equilibrium. If you only own one, you can spend a fair amount on housing. And if you choose to live in a place where car share works and transit works, you can save, you can invest everything in, in your house, which used to be a better investment than a car, but we're not so sure that that's the case anymore. <laughs> now, this is data uh, from Chris Nelson. This is in 2006, where, because as we've gone around and said, look, there needs to be a new pattern of development that's married to transit, and by the way, it's higher density, people will say, well, you're stealing the American dream. You're forcing people away from their market preference, which is large lot single family. Well, it turns out everybody wants a yacht. It's unclear that they can afford it or even will use it, but they do want it. And the single family house is a large lot single family. It's a little bit in that category. Everybody wants it, but do they, will they really use it and can they afford it is maybe the most important questions. So Nelson did this study that looked at demand over the long term, and this was uh, 03 to 25, um, for attached small lot and large lot. And what he discovered was blue is existing inventory nationwide, green is what it would be in 2025, and red is the increment. We know what we need to build between then and 25. You'll note that large lot was overbuilt at that moment. This is 2006. One of the kind of throwaway lines in that paper was, well, if this is true, then perhaps housing in America is overvalued. And perhaps we're in for a correction in the value of houses. Uh, because the marketplace and the market capacity is not there to sustain demand for the quantities that are being delivered. And so this minus 11 uh, a million households uh, turned into what we all know now is the Great Recession. Now, I would argue that the Great Recession wasn't just uh, a matter of, uh, of um, low, uh, faulty loans. It was that we produced too much of the wrong product, and we had to move it. We had to find a way to sell it. And so the gimmicks came along to backstop the phenomena that we had overbuilt a market segment. Why? Lots of complicated reasons. You all know it. Zoning is not is not at the end of the list, it's near the top. We zone for the wrong thing, and we're trapped by our own zoning. The marketplace wants to change, and land use can't change as rapidly along with it. Now, for the state of California, we updated these studies on behalf of Vision California, and we found the same thing, um, even more extreme. Large lot overbuilt through the year 2035, and that the demand will be townhouse, small lot, and multifamily. That's the market segment that we need to fill out. And as we fill those out, people who really don't, like empty nesters, don't need the single family house will vacate, move to something more appropriate uh, to their lifestyle, and thereby the resource of single family will come online and maintain. And of course, we have this huge um, overlap here. So that all says that the, the, the foundation for a fundamental shift in land use is in place in the marketplace. All we're missing is regulatory compliance with that. And if, if we can bring that about, if we can achieve the goals of SB 375, we will have laid fertile ground for an environment, of, uh, an environment for high-speed rail. As a matter of fact, high-speed rail will be essential at that point because all the other components will be in place. So 
a lot of people question this idea that, um, that land use really could affect travel behavior. And I go back uh, 20 years to in 1989 when I was hired by uh, 1,000 Friends of Oregon to they wanted to protect the urban growth boundary. The, the traffic engineers, of course, wanted to complete their loop because they're fixated with ring roads, and they wanted to build a ring road right through this beautiful valley. And we showed that you could actually spend the same money on the west side light rail and line it with transit-oriented development. It's actually the first time that idea got put at a regional scale. Well, the jury and the data is in, it's interesting enough. 1990, we did the plan. 93, it was adopted by the regional government, and by 96, the uh, VMT per capita started falling in Portland as it continued to rise in the rest of the nation, and has done so to this very day. I think the most recent numbers are Portland's down 12 percent, whereas uh, the nation at large is up 9 percent on VMT. So regional planning works, and it works fairly quickly, what's fascinating. I mean, a lot of people think, well, this is just so abstract and long term, it'll never happen. I mentioned Compass. It was a plan. Jeez, I can't even remember when, did some, when we did that. Um, but now it's kind of having a rebirth because of, uh, of the requirement for sustainable community strategies, which are what the, law, the SB 375 calls for each region to produce. Um, and of course, it goes back to this, the DNA of the region. And the D of, DNA of the Southern California region was streetcars and light rail and uh, streetcar suburbs. And those, of course, once again, marry beautifully to uh, regional uh, transit systems and, of course, inter-regional transit systems. What we discovered then, and this, of course, once again, feeds into the viability, the ridership, the demand for high-speed rail, the fact that over 50% of how, uh, or close to 50% of new houses and over 50% of new jobs could be within walking distance of Southern California's expanding transit network, which was a kind of a profound discovery because their idea of themselves is auto, freeway, uh, detached, d d disconnected. So just that this was possible. And then, of course, developing preferred development areas. We call them opportunity areas there. So the resource in much of America looks like this. It's underutilized arterials lined by low-density sprawl adding transit and public amenities, and then allowing for mixed-use development creates the kind of infill and ribbons of intensity that will support transit. And here's transit-oriented development that, that got built up long before its transit and now is finally going to get its subway uh, on Wilshire Boulevard. But this kind of idea of in intervening along these corridors, uh, which of course, once again, connects back to high-speed rail. Now, Vision California is funded by uh, the Strategic Growth Council and uh, High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, and the purpose was to frame up some larger land use alternatives and, beginning, and begin to understand the environmental and economic impacts of different choices that we could make at the scale of the state and how those would intersect with you know, benefits, costs of high speed rail. So in order to do that, we had to begin the arduous task of gathering all the data, because the GIS data for each region was all spoken, is, is still spoken in different languages. The land use uh, underpinnings of those GIS systems and models are all sadly different. So we needed to find a common language and translate all the different patterns into that. We had to develop an analytical tool that would allow us to focus on what the law was after, which was carbon reduction and VMT. Now, this is a topic that I've learned much from Betty and, and her friends over the years. But the four-step model, uh, I think, still fails dramatically when it comes to estimating travel behavior beyond worst-case automobile use. And, it, and as a matter of fact, it was designed for that. It was designed to size freeways and arterials uh, you know, with a fair amount of security at the outer edges. Um, and it, and, it, and it has, uh, there have been bells and whistles and pre-processors and post-processors placed around it to try and get a better handle on mode split, travel behavior, walk bike, the, the kind of fuzzy stuff that engineers back in the 60s and 70s really didn't care about when they were devising these models. Uh, and, you know, long story short, I still don't think it's there. Maybe the activity-based models will get us there, 
but they're very detailed. And they're not good for this kind of broad brush, statewide or region-wide scenario planning, i.e. sketching out different futures and understanding the impacts that these different futures could have, because their level of precision gets to be extraordinary. So we decided to develop a new piece of software that was based on place types and empirical relationships around place types as opposed to simulations based on the gravity model. Then we produce scenarios and metrics, and then we look at the relationship between all those metrics and the, the, the costs and benefits of high-speed rail investment. So to date, we've developed a, what we call the rapid-fire model because it's a quick fallout of the, uh, the, the effort to produce this more complex model based on place types. And it has six place types, which, and it actually is used in a way that is not map specific. So it's not as accurate as it needs to be ultimately, but it sets order of magnitude in place. And it, you know, to a certain degree, order of magnitude is what people need to understand when you're dealing with 20, 30, 40 years of growth and different growth patterns. The map-based tool, which we're calling the urban footprint, is still under development. We'll have 36 place types and we'll work on a grid cell basis as you put it into, you know, each grid cell filled with a different place type will then have uh, elasticities that modify uh, travel behavior based on location, proximity to, um, and level of transit service, what they're now calling the 8Ds. Do you remember when it was 3Ds? Do you even know what I'm talking about? Now, this is the traffic modeler speak, but uh, design density and uh, what is it? I can't remember. Um, the, the, the variables that began to introduce urban design into as, as drivers of travel behavior. Now it's gotten as complex as eight, eight elasticities. So we tend to do things as scenarios, not as predictions, not as simulations, but just saying, well, if the end state looks like this, what will the resulting impacts be? What will the resulting uh, travel behavior be? What will the land consumption? What will, and you can actually come up with definitive numbers because you're not asking somebody to believe that this future is inevitable. You're just saying, if this was the future, this is what it would result in. But of course, scenario planning used by the military all the time is very useful in understanding uh, uh, different directions and different outcomes. Now it turns out as we were developing this model, we could not only get at our key metric, which was carbon and VMT, but all of a sudden we could look at a whole range of other, what I call, co-benefits. Because in the end, when you change land use, you change many things. You change economics, you change uh, environmental impacts, you change cost of living, you change the fiscal climate for, for various jurisdictions, you change basically everything. So this is a list of the metrics that we're able to extract out of this model. Uh, air pollution, water and energy consumption in buildings, VMT of course, but the mode split and vehicle emissions. Uh, fiscal is a new module we just added which actually looks at infrastructure cost and uh, revenues so that we can look at the fiscal impact on, on cities uh, and household and, and business costs, you know, what is it in the pocketbook. And then the social dimensions, housing diversity and affordability distance to jobs, access, uh, public health impacts, and cost of living. So all this is built on models that are, are empirical. We go out, we measure places, we measure the behavior within those places, we measure the energy consumption, we measure the water consumption, uh, we look at the economics, uh, the tax base of those areas, and we feel that these are, 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 are dependable and scalable. So. Let me paint a scenario of the state of California in the year 2050 using this technique, and maybe it'll become obvious. There are three simple types. One is urban infill, which is uh, the kinds of densities, not high rise, that we, is atypical for California because of many reasons, uh, but mid rise, high density. Um, example being, there are three types. Urban infill, compact, which is like Rock Ridge, and standard, which is typical sprawl. And each one of those three has a sister or brother because it can either happen as infill or on a greenfield site. So there are effectively six conditions that get blended together. This is just an example in Oakland. Used to be parking lots, now uh, is housing. University Avenue, I did this plan many years ago. 
It's the kind of piecemeal redevelopment along uh, an arterial, and we have now lots of examples of development that have come in and replaced this low rise. And of course, one of the, one of the, the, the benefits are kind of interesting. This is a crime map of University Avenue. The highest density crime in, in Berkeley always used to be on University Avenue because it was uninhabited. It wasn't the territory. It wasn't part of anybody's neighborhood or community. It's all changed now. Um, compact development, a good example, Stapleton, the reuse. This is a 10,000 unit project. It has the same density as Rockridge. It's basically bungalow housing combined with townhouses. Key, however, is community facilities within walking distance. Uh, we tend to think of urbanism as, you know, in terms of housing densities and street networks, but those civic places that draw people together are really important to how these places function. This is a range of the housing. This top of the market, 1.3 million, can you believe it? That's the height of the market in Denver. Um, one and a half blocks away, $180,000 um, uh, um, small lot bungalow. So mixing income groups uh, demonstrated as possible again in environmental systems. So let's take those three types and just say under business as usual, 70% would be typical sprawl, as we've seen many times. 25% would be compact because the market is driving that way. By the way, Stapleton it's the highest, you know, by all developer standard, the highest returning, maintained its value through the recession, and has now come out with a higher value and higher absorption rate. Quite frankly, they're actually starting to build new housing right now, which is unheard of. Um, so that market segment of walkable mid-density is really in demand and uh, has maintained value and will continue to maintain. So give it 25% and only 5% urban infill. This is actually our historic... Uh, ratios for the state over the last 20 years. Now, if you had a fantasy of smart growth, maybe it would be 55% compact, 35% um, urban, and 10% sprawl, because that stuff's going to happen no matter what you do. There are a lot of people who just think it's the only thing to do. Now, it's not enough to describe a land use, a, a, pa a set of pat patterns of land use. You also have to couple it to policies that impact energy uh, consumption. So the adopted policy, which is what we expect we already have in the state of California, Pavley one on, on automobile efficiency, building efficiencies at 30% increase in efficiency, and power generation at 33% uh, renewable. Uh, or green technology, um, where we get up to 55 MPG, and buildings get much more efficient, and we get to a much healthier place with power generation. So the first place that plays itself out is, well, what do we end up with in 2050 if we build according to the smart growth? It turns out we still have 53% of housing as single family detached. It's not as if we're giving up the American dream by any stretch of the imagination. We're just custom fitting the market segmentation a little closer to who we actually are. Now that, and so all of a sudden it's not quite so scary because people realize when you blend that new growth with the existing housing stock, you end up with a, maybe even a healthier mix of housing. Here's one of the big outcomes, and here are all the outcomes of these two scenarios, business as usual versus growing smart. Um, today, the urban footprint in California is 5,300 square miles. Uh, it would almost double, it would more than double under the business as usual. Another 5,600 square miles of urbanism will be added, covering obviously ag land, valuable open space, adjacent open space, all the impacts, all the environmental, all the habitat, all the water issues that you can conceive of. When you think of doubling our footprint, it's pretty extraordinary. And yet that's the trajectory we are on if we don't make dramatic change. And to make dramatic change in land use, you have to marry it to dramatic change in infrastructure, which is, I keep trying to link this back to. Um, but this is monumental, 3,700 square miles of, of land, ag land and open space preserved. Uh, and so even though we still have a healthy housing mix and we haven't turned everybody, in, uh, you know, put everybody in apartment buildings, we still have husbanded our natural resources in a remarkable way. And this number is very important to many, many people. 
The infrastructure cost, as you would guess, goes down. The more compact, the less land that you're spreading development over, the less infrastructure you have to build. But what's even more interesting is that the operations and maintenance cost goes way down, once again, proportional, as you could well imagine. But putting numbers to these things uh, begins to make different um, political uh, bodies sit up and pay attention. I think it's always dangerous to frame anything with one metric. Uh, and so the multiple metric, the co-benefits that land use brings uh, to bear is really important. And then when we look at revenues, um, and I won't go into the methodology here, but it's, you know, it's been peer reviewed uh, ad nauseum because this is one of the most controversial parts of this model, uh, shows very clearly that the more compact development generates higher revenues than low density development for cities uh, on a per unit basis and therefore um, enhances as you have uh, construction operations and maintenance going down and revenues going up, all of a sudden you begin to see cities that seem to have a fiscal future that can work. Building energy gets more, uh, uh, that gets better, partly because of good intelligent design, partly because it's inherently more compact. Residential water use, this is a big issue in the state of California, goes way down. Less yards, it's simple, less yards, less parking lots. Uh, less water, less irrigation water. And, uh, and, and the, the order of magnitude here is extraordinary. A VMT comes down um, uh, dramatically in total. The numbers are too hard to conceive. But when you think of it on a per household basis, it comes down around 10,000 vehicle miles per household per year. Now, just as a point of reference, in 1960, the average house in America traveled around 11,000 VMT. Today, it's around 24,000 VMT. Uh, we're projecting 17,000. I think uh, we're very conservative with this number. I think it's obviously going to be less. There are others that think it could be more, even under a smart growth, transit-oriented future. But certainly, if we continue on existing trends, it'll be unsustainable on any level that we want to think of. And so it's very important, that, and then, of course, unsustainable fuel consumption and uh, oil imports and our foreign policy, people have made these points ad nauseum. One of the frustrations I have, however, when you see people talking about clean energy and how we can't be dependent on foreign oil, um, they tend to think of the solutions as technologies, whether it's solar collectors or uh, uh, wind turbines or high MPG cars. Uh, the reality is it's land use. It's land use is the cheapest, most cost-effective solution to all of these problems. Then you can layer on the, the, the technologies, and you, you, we will have to if we're going to get to where we need to be. But land use is the invisible wedge in that pie chart of, of um, low-carbon future that you tend to see from the climate change advocates all the time. Um, and it needs to be there because I believe it's the foundation. Until we get best practices in land use and, of course, the, inf the infrastructure that supports the right kind of land use, i.e. transit, we're, we can't build enough solar collectors. And by God, you know the environmentalists are going to be out there opposing solar farms in the desert. They already are. And wind farms wherever because of the visual and bird impacts. I mean, there's nothing we can do that doesn't have an environmental impact. And, uh, well, actually, I think high-speed rail knows that, right? They have some environmental impact, and the environmentalists are all over it. And it's because they're missing the big picture, which is if we don't do this kind of thing, uh, we have much greater environmental impacts. Um, but that's a tragedy of small thinking. Um, the household economics, very important to many, many people. And obviously, when you add all these benefits up and you add reduction in automobile dependence, you get a more affordable lifestyle. Is it an inferior lifestyle? That, I guess that's going to be everybody's debate. Uh, but being stuck in traffic is not a particularly high quality uh, existence, I don't think. Uh, recently, we had a module built that looks at um, uh, health impacts. So far, we've gotten to air quality impacts on respiratory, uh, which then, of course, has to do with uh, deaths and, and health incidents, but also has to do with costs in, in, uh, in health care, which is also a, a current topic in the U.S. Um, 
we will be getting to, it's more complex, the, related, the relationship to obesity. Uh, clearly, there is a relationship there. There are many things that drive obesity besides exercise, but uh, walking is certainly one of the things that can have a big impact. So um, it's all a matter of proportions. And the key here is to begin to understand the order of magnitude of these differences, so that, and also the range of co-benefits that come with the transit-oriented package. And finally, we have the greenhouse gas emissions uh, targets for AB32, which we more than satisfy because land use can create a framework that makes it much more cost effective to deploy all the other technologies that we have to do. Now, this is a complicated graph that maybe is more detailed than I want to go. Actually, I'm out of time. Am I? Tell me if I should stop. This is just more data than you want to know. Um, but I just want to touch on one other thing, which is the Bay Area. Um, the Bay Area's transit network doesn't seem as robust as what they're conceiving in Southern California. And the overlap between high-speed rail and that system is not as, uh, as uh, extensive. Um, there are only uh, four stations, and I think that's even being debated. And so playing a, a very large role uh, in the Bay Area, high-speed rail, I think, is, is very important. Um, what's fascinating to me, of course, is it reinforces a pattern that we already have in place, which is job concentration on the peninsula. Uh, if jobs are going to flock to, and I believe they will, high-speed rail stations, that's going to further impact an imbalance that's really extraordinary in the Bay Area, which puts up a big land use challenge. Today, we have over 178,000 people in commuting daily into the Bay Area because they can't afford housing or they can't find housing near their jobs. This is the cost of a house median home value as of 2009 uh, in San Jose and San Francisco. Those are the two highest locations in the United States. It makes Manhattan, uh, puts Manhattan to shame. And the median for the whole country is 185. I mean, it's extraordinary what's happened. And it is a scarcity economy. Uh, and so housing coming on the backbone, we can't do the level of impact, infill that we need to do in the Bay Area if we don't add transit networks. High-speed rail is one piece of that. But many others have to come into play. Uh, it's just not going to function. And I won't get into all these numbers. So I'll stop here, and maybe we'll have a, a dialogue about all this. Um, what's exciting to me is because of SB 375, we're looking finally, holistically, at growth patterns, and we're beginning to see our infrastructure investments in the context of some very big dis differences. If we choose the right urban form for our future, what will fall out of that is the necessary transit investments. And part of the problem, I think, right now is we're arguing a high-speed rail or this transit in a, in a vacuum without having uh, adjudicated uh, what kind of future land use patterns we want and then deduce from that, well, what, what transit networks are essential to making that land use pattern viable? Thank you. very poorly. I mean, redevelopment and uh, tax increment financing, which is the primary tool, and of course, I don't think Jerry just wants to get rid of redevelopment agencies. He wants to grab the money that's uh, implicit in tax increment financing. Uh, it's essential to infill. You can't do infill with tax, without those kind of uh, ta tax dollars recycled into the, the neighborhood for the improvements that are necessary to sustain the infill. So once again, you're let, you, what seems to me happening over and over again is that we're making very long-term decisions based on short-term needs. We have a short-term deficit. 
or we're, we're arguing about whether, you know, in the next two years we're going to have this or that ridership. Um, instead of saying, well, what is the long-term future that we, we know we have to arrive at, and then backing into well, what tools, whether they're institutional or, or infrastructure, what tools are essential to arriving at that point. And so there's a flawed decision-making process. The, the one thing that I think is important about Vision California is that it's the first time anybody's laid out there and said, well, here is a 50-year future. Where do you want to end up in the year 2050? What do you think is sustainable at that point? And when you look at your, today's questions in the light of that information, you come up with totally different conclusions. But unfortunately, we're not in the habit of doing this kind of work. And, and even though we've done it, it actually has received very little attention. And um, we all know our political system is built on very short um, perspectives. And so that is a huge dilemma. Now, I have a proposal that I'm trying to advance in, at the state legislature for a implementation uh, law for SB 375, which would basically take all the redevelopment agencies and repurpose them to transit-oriented development. Right now, their marching orders are blighted areas, reinvestment, and economic revitalization of blighted areas. And that's led them into some fairly complicated cul-de-sacs that allow people to throw, uh, to be quite critical of how uh, the behavior of redevelopment agencies. Uh, if they had a new purpose in life, uh, which they should at this point, which is to support transit-oriented development and infill, and it needs support, all the same tools in their box could be used on behalf of inserting housing and jobs near transit and improving walking, bike, and local transit networks to support that. And so they would have a new purpose that was very tuned up to the kind of future we need to go. So uh, we're going to be proposing that that, um, that happen. But um, there's a lot of politics between that idea and where, where we are today. Um, my name is Bijan. Sort of a simple question, really, is that uh, should the light transit move forward and actually begin to gain enough momentum to begin building more and putting things in place, and what you're doing with bringing in these new corridors with the two larger areas continues to happen simultaneously? How do you see that emerging? Um, through the, you know, we have this structure. We have the MPOs, which are doing regional plans that are fairly, uh, you know, detailed in their understanding of the transportation networks and investments that are at hand. And they're allocating jobs and housing around that infrastructure. There's not a single, as they called it, SCS, a Sustainable Community Strategy, which is required by law of the MPOs, that doesn't, in the end, become transit-oriented development at the regional scale. And so that all kind of sets the framework. Then the local governments... The problem is bringing local government land use into compliance with this SCS plan. Um, and that's where there's a few gaps in the law that needs to be filled in. But uh, for those places that are opportunistic and they see this as the right future and the, the immediate marketplace is driving there anyway, uh, they will update their general plan and zoning. And I think more importantly, perhaps do specific area plans, a, a unique law to California that's very useful in this term to create um, very, very detailed plans for how all that, all the pieces come together. Great, thank you all very much.